what my lab is working on these days. Uh, it's been uh, really a wonderful conference, chatting with all of you uh, after the talks, listening to the talks, and so forth. I think there are a lot of overlapping interests, certainly between my group and my, uh, many of you. Uh, today, what I want to do is tell you about ongoing work, so I'm not going to show you any published, uh, published work, meaning that um, you know, in one slide, I'll tell you about what my group has been doing in the past, uh, just so you know what you can come and chat with me about in the next couple of days. Uh, so as, uh, as Simon mentioned, one of the major interests in my group has been studying uh, sudden transitions in populations. Right? So in general, uh, we're interested in kind of how interactions within a population or a community can lead to interesting evolutionary and ecological dynamics. So one of the most basic things that can happen is that if you have cooperative growth, you can have a sudden transition in response to a deteriorating environment. And we've been interested in kind of early warning indicators and kind of universal behaviors of populations near these tipping points. Now, any time that you have these sorts of cooperative behaviors, you might also want to ask, uh, is it possible for sort of non-productive cheats to uh, emerge and spread in the population? So we've been interested in these sorts of dynamics, and in particular, what sort of ecological uh, conditions might favor or disfavor uh, the, uh, the emergence of these uh, cooperative or cheating type behaviors. And uh, some of this work was actually uh, done by Al Sanchez, who's now at Yale. Is, well, not currently at Yale. Right now he's here, but in general he's at Yale. Uh, so, uh, right, so much of this behavior is here. We're looking at uh, cases where you have secretion of some sort of enzyme that helps to break down a complex sugar source. But we, uh, so this is uh, what you might think of as the creation of a public good. Right, we've also been interested in uh, an analogous set of situations where it's uh, the degradation of a public bad. Right, so there are many contexts in which antibiotics, the way in which a population gains resistance, is via degradation of the antibiotic. Right, so if you have degradation of some antibiotic, then you may be able to protect sensitive cells. Right? And so we, for example, see coexistence between resistant and sensitive um, populations, for example, in ampicillin. Moreover, you, you can also, uh, well, we've also demonstrated that you can have a mutualism, right? So you can have two antibiotic resistant strains that together can grow in the presence of both antibiotics because they're each breaking down one of the antibiotics. And, uh, and then finally, we're in, uh, interested in a variety of kind of spatial dynamics. How is it that cooperative growth processes uh, will alter uh, the, uh, the kind of spatial patterns that you get? Much of this work has been in collaboration with Kirill Korolev, who was also uh, a postdoc at MIT and is now a professor at BU, and also uh, here. So you guys should chat with uh, them about those projects. Kirill was also involved in a number of the early warning indicator uh, projects. All right, so, uh, so these, uh, these projects, I think, highlight the range of the interactions that you can get when you have uh, interactions within a population. But in almost all of that work, it was really interactions within a single population, within a, within a single species. And of course, the problem that we're all facing now is that uh, the, that's not the way that these microbial uh, populations are behaving in nature, right? They're in these complex communities containing you know, many, many species. All right? This is too complicated for me, so uh, we are kind of, a lot of our work now is focused on the multi-species communities, but when I say multi-species, I mean n greater than one. Right? So we're kind of taking a bottom-up approach to this problem, where we're basically trying to understand pairs, trios, and kind of marching our way up. It's not obvious uh, to the degree to which the insights that we get in these simple communities are necessarily going to hold in the complex communities that we all care about, but you, know, you have to start somewhere, and so this is, uh, this is our approach. All right, so I'll tell you uh, a, few, a few different kind of projects in, in my group. All right, so uh, first, uh, we've been recently thinking about how, you know, what are the typical ways in which communities will change in response to a deteriorating environment, in, in particular in response to increased mortality. Right, it, just very generally, it seems that increased mortality favors fast-growing species. This is true in pairs as well as within simple communities. All right, so we've also been interested in these kind of network of pairwise competitive interactions. So we found that they're surprisingly informative regarding the structure of multi-species communities. Right, and so then there's the question, well, what sort of network motifs or structures with, that um, in natural communities may help facilitate the diversity that we see in nature? And one of the proposals is that there could be a lot of these non-transitive or rock, paper, scissors type interactions. Right, and what we've found is that, at least in the communities that we have looked at, is that we can't find any of them. All right, so we've looked at thousands of trios, can't find them. All right, so our, our sense is that these uh, are probably not common uh, in natural populations, although this is something that everyone likes to argue about. Uh, and then finally, uh, on a slightly more mechanistic side, uh, so much of the approach that we take in my group is sort of phenomenological in the sense that we are trying to uh, characterize uh, the interaction using some simple parameters and asking to what degree can we predict what happens later. Right, but, uh, 
it's also good to go and look in and say, okay, well, what is actually mediating the interaction? And what, one thing that we found that is surprisingly dominant in determining the structure of the communities that we've been looking at is uh, modifications of the pH of the environment. All right. So, um, all right. So, just to get started, uh, so this uh, this is a uh, project that is being led by uh, Clara Breu, who is a physics PhD student in my group. And what she wanted to just ask is, well, if we were to uh, imp impose a general mortality onto a community, uh, what is it that you might be able to predict in general? Right. So, the idea is that we have some complex community, right, and it's going to be put under stress. Right. This stress could take a variety of forms: right, antibiotics, diarrhea attacked by the immune system. All right, so some of these could be specific, but right now we're going to try to imagine a general increase in mortality. What we want to know is, what is going to be the structure of the resulting community? Okay. So as I said, we want to start simple, so we're going to start with pairs. Right? And in particular, I think it's, it's worth highlighting that uh, in, in our group, we've been studying a lot of pairwise competitions, and almost all the time what we see are simple outcomes. All right? So there's basically three things that we see over and over again. It's not just, you know, and other people see these things too. But I just want to, it's good to be clear about what the simple, that because it's easy to imagine that everything has to be infinitely complex. But what we find is that at least in the context of pairs, things tend to be simple. All right? So one thing that we often see is dominance, where if you just compete two species and you measure the fraction over time, what you see is that one species outcompetes the other species. Okay? So dominance. Competitive exclusion. Uh, another thing that we often see is coexistence, right? So you compete a pair of species and they coexist in that environment, right? At some equilibrium fraction that's independent of the starting fraction that you do the competition at. Uh, and then finally, uh, we, uh, we sometimes also see bistability, where the outcome of the competition depends upon how you start, right? So what you see is that if you start with a lot of one species, it's going to win and vice versa. Right, and this is actually all experimental data, but it's just t characterizing the three typical things that we see when we compete pairs of species. Right, so maybe 95% of the time we see one of these outcomes. 5% of the time we see something crazy. Right, crazy could mean a variety of different things. Uh, sometimes there's just rapid evolutionary dynamics, so you mix and you see that oh, things kind of go weird. Right, it happens. All right, evolution you can't always forget about. Okay. Uh, Sometimes we've actually also seen bistability with coexistence in one of the states. All right, so here, this is bistability with competitive with exclusion on each side, extinction of one or the other. We've also seen a few cases where it's bistable, but one of the two states has coexistence. Okay. And then finally, uh, occasionally we've seen oscillations, well, at least once in the context of this mutualism between the antibiotic resistance strains, we, uh, we actually see period three oscillations. All right. So there, these sorts of things can happen, but in almost all cases, we see one of the, uh, one of the three things on top, okay? uh, which, is, uh, which is convenient because those are the basic outcomes that arise in just the simplest models that you might write down of pairwise comp uh, competition, in particular, this competitive lotka volterra model. Right? So the idea here is that you just have two species that are uh, inhibiting each other's growth, and depending, as a function of the strength of the inhibition, then you get these three, or you, know, you could think of it as four outcomes. Right? Here, there's dominance and then Exclusion, kind of the same thing, flip side, right? Coexistence and bistability. So you get coexistence if, you, if, there, if there's weak suppression of uh, each other's growth, and you get bistability if there's strong suppression of each other's growth. And right? just to be concrete, and right, I'm going to put in this is kind of the only equation I'm going to include, right? Just to be concrete, so this is the two species, this is the per capita growth rate here, right? And what it's determined by is just a few things, right? There's a maximum growth rate, this R1. Right. It, inhib in it inhibits itself. In this case, the assumption is it inhibits itself logistically. Right. So it just decreases linearly like this. And then finally, there's the inhibition by the competitor. Right. It's a very simple model. And I want to stress that this model is certainly not true. Right. In any actual set of species, this is none of the assumptions in here is actually what's happening. Right. And so the question in my mind is, what are the uh, qualitative predictions of a model, and do they actually pan out in a given experimental system? Okay. All right, so in particular, what I'm going to do is just ask, all right, if we take this model and we add a uniform mortality, what happens? All right, so uniform mortality means we're just up here and we just add this delta term, all right? So this is just uh, meaning that both species are experiencing some uh, increase in mortality, all right? Very simple assumption. It turns out in the context of this model, there's a very simple prediction because this delta can actually just be um, brought into those other terms, and so you can just redefine the parameters within this model, and there's a simple geometric interpretation. 
Right, so now I, instead of N1 and N2, I'm calling it NF and NS. We're assuming that one of them is gonna be faster, more fast growing than the other, so RF is larger than RS. Right, so in general, that's just a label, so that you can assume that without loss of generality. Right, and what happens in, the con in this context is there's something very simple, that as you increase the mortality rate, the prediction for, in this model is that you should just travel down uh, and to the right at a 45 degree angle. So for example, if you start up here where the slow grower is winning, right, so it's slow growing, but maybe a strong competitor, so it could still win. As you increase the mortality, the expectation is that you'll travel down this 45 degree angle where you're favoring the fast grower, so eventually you expect to make the fast grower win, but along the way, you expect to cross either a region of coexistence or a region of bistability, but not both. Okay. So again, this model is certainly not gonna be an accurate or quantitative description of any given real pair of species, but this is a qualitative prediction of the model that could be robust to the fact that the assumptions are not actually gonna be uh, true in any given system. All right, so that's, a, it's a, that's an experimental question, right? Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, so then what we did is we went and we, you know, we, we do a lot of competition between species, so we basically just started looking at some of our species where, uh, the, in particular, the slow growers seem to be strong competitors. And what we found is that this basic picture is surprisingly predictive regarding what happens in pairwise competitions. All right, and important, uh, yeah, so let me do uh, Right, so I'll tell you the, about the experiments. So what we're doing is we're just competing pairs of species uh, in liquid, right? And uh, we allow the, uh, the populations to grow up, and then each day we're gonna perform a dilution where we transfer a small fraction of the cells into fresh media, and then uh, they, uh, the population grows back up or the community competition uh, occurs again. We just repeat this process five or six times, typically 50 to 70 generations, so that we allow the competition uh, to reach resolution as in the data that I showed you before, okay? Right, and, uh, in particular, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna increase this dilution in order to impose an increased mortality on both species, right? And, and indeed, it's symmetric, it's, it's imposed on both species. Okay? Um, and, um, and this basic picture works surprisingly well, all right? So what we see, for example, is that when we compete uh, Pseudomonas veronii against Enterobacter orogenes, what we see is that PV, the slow grower, is winning at low dilution factor, but then as we increase the dilution, we cross this regime as kind of expected, so I'll show you the data, but just give you a picture that this is what we think is happening. All right, so first of all, if we look at the fast grower fraction, that at low dilution factor, it goes down, right? So we get exclusion of the fast grower, yeah, that's fine. The question is, what happens as we increase the dilution rate? Um, and it's really just as we were kind of expecting, which is that you see that the fast grower, it loses at low dilution factor, we get coexistence at intermediate dilution factor, and then we get, uh, the, uh, we get the fast grower winning at high dilution factor. I'm sorry that it's very hard to see those lines, but uh, yes. Right, and the, um, the way that we like to visualize this sort of data is uh, via these things we're calling subway plots, where what we show here is basically the color of the species is telling you about whether that species can survive at equilibrium when in competition uh, at that, uh, at that uh, dilution factor. Right, so here, blue is saying that only that slow grower is surviving, at intermediate dilution factor, we get coexistence, and at high dilution factor, uh, we have, again, uh, competitive exclusion where the fast grower is excluding the slow grower. Yes? Yes, so in, in, indeed, in all of these conditions, the monocultures can survive in all those conditions, yeah. But I think what you're highlighting, though, is that at some limit, this thing has to be true, right? Because if you dilute faster than the slow grower grows, then, um, then it's gonna go extinct and the other one should win. Right, so indeed, that in the limit, it's, it's kind of trivial or it has to happen, uh, and, you know, but, in, um, but it, it happens in very particular ways, I guess. Yes? Okay, all right, so the question is about the slow grower, like why is it, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, so, uh, Right, so we've been characterizing many pairs just to get st a statistical sense of what's going on. So we have not, in this case, delved into what is the mechanism regard you know, behind that. Yeah, All right, so, okay, so for example, it could be that, uh, that the slow grower is making a toxin uh, that is costly to make. Also yeah, sorry, sorry, slow grower, yeah, so yeah, exactly. What I'm referring to is the, the growth rate on its own, yeah. And it's the growth rate at low density on its own, yeah. Both species the same. It's modifying the outcome. 
by sampling both species. Uh, oh, I see, I see, because you, by sampling, you're, you're imposing a mortality. Yeah. You're doing exactly what you said there. You're putting a rare effect. Yeah. And, um, and, and if you want to do that, that's fine, but you, yeah, but you have to be aware that you are doing it, right? Uh, and I, I guess I, I'm a little bit embarrassed by some of this stuff because we've been, we've been spending years doing competitions or, well, at least thinking about this stuff. And, um, you know, we often, I didn't think too hard about what, the, what dilutions we were using in the sense that uh, we would often just say, oh, yeah, you know, all right, this, this pseudomonad, it outcompetes this other species in minimal media with X media. You know, so we define the media, but we often don't feel that we need to specify the dilution factor. Yet what you can see is that you know, I can make anything happen by changing the dilution factor, right? So, um, you know, so it's, I guess, a warning to my group and also, you know, to all of us. Yes? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, we're, we're only allowing a fraction of each of the two species to survive when we do the dilution. Uh, so in that sense, I would say it's the same mortality that is, same, same mean mortality is experienced by both species. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, we spend a lot of our life thinking about density-dependent effects, for sure. Uh, but just basically, it may not only affect delta. It could also affect R. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, for sure. And again, that model is super simple. And none of the terms in the model are correct. And that's what I find surprising, is that the qualitative prediction of the model works not just for this species, but for others, despite the fact that all sorts of, I mean, that life is complicated, yet, yeah, you know, I guess, you know, I'm always looking for what simple things can we say, despite the complexity of life, right? And I, I guess this seems to be a pretty robust thing, right? That you favor the fast grower, and in, and in between, you cross either co a region of coexistence or a region of bi-stability. All right, so I'll, maybe I'll, oh, and, and, okay, so I showed you data for one pair, but uh, we've done this for, you know, for many pairs. Uh, and in particular here, what we've done is we've taken four different species with different growth rates. And what you can see is that at low dilution factor, the slow growers do better than the fast growers, right? But as we increase the dilution factor, we can plot just the mean fraction of each of those species in all the pairwise competitions. And you see there's just very clear patterns as we shift, right? What you see is that the slow growers do worse and worse, the fast growers do better and better, and then you can kind of interpolate between them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Okay, yeah, so in, in almost all these cases, there's only, there was only one pair that had bi-stability. So in, in all these cases, basically what we did is we started with a bunch of different fractions. Uh, and in only one of these pairs was there bi-stability. So it actually doesn't, it doesn't, this, this sort of data doesn't, is not affected very much by that. But yeah, we started with a wide range of fractions, yeah. Uh, all right, and, uh, all right, so this is how the pairwise uh, competitive outcomes are varied as we vary mortality, right? It favors the fast grower in stereotypical ways. And the question is, well, what can we say about more complex communities? Well, uh, you know, so luckily we've spent a fair amount of time over the last few years thinking about these community assembly rules. So based on pairwise competitive outcomes, what can you say about, uh, about simple communities, right? So, all right, so first of all, this is the subway plots for three, uh, three other pairs, right? What you see is that the two fast growers, they coexist at all dilution factors, and that's because their growth rates are so similar, you don't have much of a lever arm as you vary that dilution rate, so then you don't change the outcome. But the other two pairs, they have a difference in growth rate, and again, you have the slow grower winning over here, a region of coexistence, and then the fast grower wins. And the question is, all right, so these are three pairwise outcomes. What can we say about what would happen if you have all three species together? Okay. And in particular, we have proposed these community assembly rules that are based on qualitative pairwise outcomes to qualitative uh, trio outcomes, or more. And basically what uh, the proposal is is that we're going to say that a species will survive in the multi-species competition if and only if it's not excluded in any of the pairwise competitions. All right, in particular, if you look down here, for example, the yellow species is outcompeting each of the other two in pairs, so then we would predict that it's gonna outcompete them in the context of the trio, so only maybe yellow will survive down here, and we can kind of apply this rule all the way down. And at least, for example, in this trio, that assembly rule works for all the dilution factors. All right, what happens is that the yellow is the only one that survives at low dilution factor, over here at 10 to the 5, you see that there's coexistence of all three pairs, so you would then predict coexistence of the trio, and indeed that's what we observe experimentally. 
And then finally, at high dilution factor, since, uh, since the yellow species is outcompeted in the pairwise, you would predict it to be outcompeted in the trio, and indeed it is. Right? So, um, as what we've, you know, so before what we found is that these assembly rules predict, uh, correctly predict survival uh, about 90% of the time in the context of um, going from pairs to trios or, or four or five. Uh, and indeed, we see, again, similar things. You hear it happen to work for all of these dilution factors, but we've, we've done all the trios and the four. You know, so, um, and indeed, 90% of the time, we correctly predict survival. So it's not 100%, and you wouldn't expect it to be 100%, but, uh, but it's, I'd say, not bad. Uh, and just to be, to, be, to be concrete, in the previous experiment, instead of varying the environment, what we had done is we had just taken eight species and done all the pairs and trios in, in a single environment, and that's kind of where we had first uh, developed these assembly rules. Right, and so that, um, that generates some sort of network. Um, oh, and incidentally, we've also recently found that the, uh, these assembly rules work surprisingly well uh, in determining the structure of the, uh, the gut microbiome in, um, in the worm. In particular, if you apply these rules, uh, you can predict the uh, fraction at equilibrium in the gut of the worm uh, within uh, about 10%, actually. So the median across 20-some trios was an error of 10%, which, frankly, is close to our measurement error. You know, I mean, if you just do the same thing. Over. So uh, it's surprisingly good, I would say. All right, so given that these pairwise outcomes seem to be so uh, helpful in sort of guiding our thinking in the context of determining community structure, a natural question is to ask, uh, to what degree, you know, what does this uh, network look like if you were to sample it from some sort of natural, uh, natural community, some co-occurring set of bacteria, right? Because all of the species so far that we've been studying were just from random soil isolates taken from different parts of the world, and then we just put them together and see what happens, right? So to get at this question of what it is that these, uh, this network might look like within a, an actual community, what, uh, what my um, microbiology student uh, Logan did is she just... Um, she, well, she, she sampled from a single grain of soil, isolated 20 species, and then measured all the pairwise outcomes. Right. Now, the, the reason that she wanted to do this is because you know, there's a, one of the major questions in ecology is to try to understand how it is that the diversity uh, is sta you know, that we see in natural communities, how is it that that's possibly stable? Um, and I'm not going to solve that question here, but this is what we're trying to figure out. Yeah? Um, yeah, so uh, went out to the front yard, I dug know. 10 centimeters. So oxy, algae, that sort of thing? Oh, so every, yeah, all of this is, uh, is done in the presence of oxygen. Yeah, we, we, have, an, uh, we have a chamber that, yeah, but yeah, this is all done in, uh, in the presence of oxygen. Yeah. Right, so, um, so maybe the structure of these, this network might give us some insight into how it is that these communities can be uh, so diverse. Right. So the question is, if you go and you look at some set of species and you measure the, their competitions, their, uh, how they interact, then maybe you might see some patterns in that network that would provide uh, guidance in terms of what's going on. Right? So you might, for example, see something like modularity where different sub-networks are strongly interacting, or maybe you'll look up here and you'll see something like uh, these non-transitive rock, paper, scissors type interactions. And the reason you might expect those right, is because that, uh, they're predicted to increase the diversity in a community because if you have something that looks like this, then no species can get too abundant because that opens the door for another species to be spreading. Right, so there's a great deal of theory uh, in this uh, field basically asking as, you go, as competition becomes, goes from being very transitive, like a competitive hierarchy like you were talking about, to, uh, to more non-transitive, then you expect to be able to get more diversity at equilibrium. Right? Um, but uh, this is an experimental question, right? We have to go out and we have to make measurements to see what these networks actually look like. All right, so what, uh, what Logan did is she just walked out of the door of the, uh, the lab. She went into the grass. She yeah, dug 10 centimeters down, grabbed a grain of soil, brought it back to the lab, you know, vortexed, plated in the presence of oxygen. And uh, I said many species, but in particular, she chose 20 of them to study further and do all the pairwise competitions. Uh, and, uh, all right, just to tell you, yeah, so what we see is basically what Karina was talking about before, which is we found a very strong competitive hierarchy, right? So it's really that uh, as you, one species with basically the best could beat everybody, this species could beat everyone except for the first, all the way down, right? So this is the kind of network that should be least favorable for leading to diversity, but it's what we see. Right? And I'll, I'll show you the, the data just so that you can believe that we did a lot of work. All right. This is uh, the 20 species uh, 
arranged in order of mean competitive fraction in all of the measurements. And what you can see is that basically there's a lot of red down here, meaning that these species are outcompeted, go extinct as a result of competing with the vertical one. A lot of green up here, meaning that these species drive these other ones extinct. Blue corresponds to coexistence between the two, and yellow corresponds to bi-stability. So in all these pairs, we did a 5%, 95% starting condition, so we could assay for bi-stability. Right? And what you see is that there's a very strong competitive hierarchy. Yeah, so this is, this is measuring yeah, after 60 generations, yeah, what happened? Which is presumably traded off against the Rs. Yeah, okay, so this is a, a mixture of the alphas and the Rs. Um, this was all doing daily dilutions of 100. We actually, we thought that maybe that this competitive hierarchy was driven by the dilutions. So then we went and we repeated this for a dilution, for a low dilution, and it, there, it was still hierarchical. So it, yeah. So, but you still expect that because in zoological empirics, Yes, except that once you add a dilution in there, then it couples to the R's, like what we were talking about before. Yeah. Yeah. So there are many possible explanations. This is one of them. Yeah, I'm. We, I'm not going to give the answer for why these things coexist, because I don't know. Uh, but it was Roy first. Yeah? All right, so the question is, how many of these competitions can be turned around by doing different dilutions? Um, I would say that over the range that we have access to, I think we could, change, we could probably alter a third of them. But we have, I'm, we've only done two. I mean, it's a lot of work to do one of these matrices. Uh, yeah. 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 So this was one tenth LB. We've also done it in a um, in a defined media. We also seen hierarchy. So yeah, of course, we're this is not the soil that we're, you know in a lot of different ways. But as far as we can tell, we have not been able to get rid of the hierarchy despite a fair amount of effort to do so, in the sense of different medias, different dilutions. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so this is, okay, so the question is whether the logical Volterra model predicts oscillations. So, unfortunately, not this logical Volterra model. It's, it's the predator prey logical Volterra model. Um, yeah, but we don't, we basically don't see oscillations anyway. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, so yeah, all of the data that I've shown so far, uh, the species abundances were determined by plating because they have different colony morphologies. About, about the genus? Yeah. Oh, the cheaters. Oh, uh, well, okay, so. Uh, yeah, so there could be um, many complications here. Yeah, so all of the competitions we've done here uh, we're done from single colonies, so we don't. So this is we're trying to study ecology rather than evolution, right? I mean, you know, and as I said, a few percent of the time you can't get away from evolution. But by and large, these are clonal populations within each species, and we're competing species. Uh, you know, but yeah. So we're really just trying to focus on the ecology. Okay. All right. Uh, Extreme competitive hierarchy, and in particular, you can go and you can look at all the different trios and ask how many different cases of this sort of rock, paper, scissors type interactions can you find, right? So with 20 species, um, there's over 1,000 trios that you can look at. So we went and you know, asked, okay, can we find any rock, paper, scissors? Um, and the answer is, is no, all right? So the, basically, there were no uh, robust examples of rock, paper, scissors among, uh, among these 20 species. So um, our and, and, and yeah, so our sense is that well, we spent a lot of effort trying to find uh, these non-transitive type interactions, uh, and we can't. So my um, provisional takeaway is that uh, that they're not playing a significant role in stabilizing the diversity we see in natural communities. Ah, so there we are. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll, uh, you know, I'll probably not finish what I was going to say, but that's fine. All right. Okay. Uh, but you could hold the rest of the question. 
Okay, all right, then I'll, um, all right, I'll, I'll try to be clear so that you don't have burning questions. All right, so, so far, what we've been doing is taking this purely phenomenological approach. We're just asking, what is uh, the interactions, but there's some effective interaction between the species, what can we say based on that? All right, and in particular, we're, um, we were imagining that there was some direct interaction between the species influencing each other. All right, but of course, in the context of, of microbes, most of the interactions are mediated through the environment. All right, so things are being secreted or uptaken from the environment, and that's influencing the growth of other species. So uh, the question is, what can, we, what can we say about this sort of environment-mediated type interaction? In particular, um, my postdoc, Christoph, has found lots of examples where it's really the pH that's determining an awful lot of what you, um, what you might want to know. All right, so first of all, uh, you know, microbes, when they grow, they change the pH of the media. I think we've all seen this, but I just want to highlight that it's ubiquitous. All right, this is just, we took 119 different um, bacterial species that we had gotten from the soil. We grew it up in some, uh, you know, vaguely reasonable media. We measured the pH afterwards, and what you see is pH goes everywhere. We started at pH 7. Okay, there's a couple species that stay there, but almost all of them change the pH. Some of them acidify, some of them alkalize, a variety of effects associated with, my, with the growth in terms of the pH. Right, and the question is, is this important? Right, and, uh, and we're going to argue that the answer is yes. Right, so what we see is that the pH can lead to all the kinds of phenomena that we've been studying in the context of a lot of these other interactions in the context, for example, uh, breaking down sugars. So first of all, you can have positive interactions where uh, a microbial species is, say, acidifying the environment, and that's good for it. For example, budding yeast does this. Right, and this leads to all the stuff about cooperative growth, minimal viable density required for survival, all the stuff that we and others have been thinking about in the context of cooperative growth shows up for, uh, for pH as well. We also see that there are many cases where microbes change the pH of the environment in a way that's bad for it, and this leads uh, to something that you might call ecological suicide, where a population kind of kills itself. Uh, and then we also see that just by thinking about the pH, we can uh, often get a good prediction regarding the kinds of outcomes that might happen when we compete pairs of species. All right, so this, um, yeah, right, so some people think that Easter Island population of humans had this ecological suicide kind of thing, right, where you know, the uh, Easter Island started looking something like this, and then humans came, they chopped down all the trees, and then uh, they left behind this. There's a lot of arguments among anthropologists about whether the human population on Easter Island actually did this. I'm not going to try to convince you that that's the case, but uh, what I will try to convince you, and incidentally, um, uh, Ying Yu Huang uh, on Monday talked about a quorum sensing mutant that did really precisely the same, the, the, this thing here, where uh, in that case it was alkalization, but um, what we see is that many different species will change the pH of the environment uh, in either direction in a way that is, is so bad for it that it kills itself. So this is just, uh, this is an example of data for a particular species where we uh, at high kind of temporal resolution went in, you know, plated to measure the CFUs. What you see is that the number of live bacteria, it grows exponentially, but then very rapidly dies exponentially, and after 24 hours, and we actually, there are no viable cells left in the, uh, left in the media. Uh, and indeed, this is accompanied by an acidification in this case. Um, doesn't prove that it's pH, but we can, uh, for example, increase the buffering, and what you see is that uh, eventually you can, uh, you can save the population by adding a sufficient buffer, right? So, uh, and it's not, again, this is not just this species, it's surprisingly common, actually. Uh, and given that this is already kind of a weird phenomenon, it, it, there are a bunch of corollaries of it that are very natural. In particular, what we can do is we can harm the bacterial population in order to save it. Right? So what we can do, for example, is do a bunch of different things that harm it. We've done antibiotics, ethanol, salts, right? lots of different things to harm the population can actually save it. And right? so what I'm showing you here, for example, is the fold growth experienced by the population as a function of an antibiotic that we're adding. In the absence of the antibiotic, the population's all dead. It's this ecological suicide phenomenon I was telling you about. If you add enough antibiotic, you can kill the population again. Right? Not a huge surprise. But there's this region of antibiotic concentration where you can save the population because you're inhibiting growth and preventing that acidification that was going to kill the population. Okay? And I think that this, is, this has interesting consequences if you think about what happens when you have mixed populations, communities, resistance sensitive. I'm not going to get into it, but, um, but it's, a, it's a kind of a natural surprising consequence. Yeah, so th this is just... This is just batch uh, growth over one cycle, but we can also, we've also done um, multiple growth dilution cycles, and the same basic thing happens. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, right, and it's common. Uh, all right, but I, yeah, I do want to just highlight that uh, this interactions with the, between the pH, there, um, there are just a few different kinds of interactions that you can imagine. Right? Basically, because there's different combinations of whether each species is acidifying or alkalizing, and whether that's good or bad for the species. Right? So what you can do is you can just make a little table where you can say, all right, well, what is it that the pH, what is it the pH that they're, is, they're imposing on the environment, and what is it that they prefer? So you get cooperation on this diagonal, and you have uh, inhibition, possible ecological suicide in the other one, and then you can ask, all right, what are the possible outcomes that can occur based on combining these different species? Um, and, um, and there are some very, I think, just basic, interesting qualitative outcomes. Right? So first, if each species is changing the pH in a way that's good for it but bad for its competitor, you might imagine that could lead to bi-stability between the population. Um, and indeed, that's something that we can observe experimentally. You can also imagine that there's a case where a species is trying to change, is trying to say acidify the environment and, make it, and it's good for it, but can't quite do it on its own, but could do it with the help of another species that maybe you could get an example of succession, where a second species helps the first species survive, but doesn't survive at the end of the day. And indeed, we see that, kind of, uh, that outcome experimentally as well. You might also imagine that there could be something that you could call a murder-suicide, where it's, a, it's an environment where a given species is going to be killing itself, and along the way, it kills its partner species. Um, and indeed, we see that experimentally. Uh, and then finally, you can imagine that uh, if each species is doing something that's bad for it, then if, but in opposite directions, then they could stabilize each other, right? So there could be an example of a mutual, uh, mutualism, uh, and indeed we can uh, see that experimentally as well, right? So this, and this is all just based on knowing how the single species behaves in, um, in a monoculture and how, uh, how the pH uh, is altering its growth, okay? And I'll do the last, uh, last slide because I think it's fun. All right, so in this case of uh, bi-stability that I mentioned, where the two species are each changing the pH in a way that's good for it but bad for the competitor, all right, you can think about this in the context of um, alternative stable states. So in the human uh, gut microbiome, there's a lot of attention that's being paid to what we think are alternative stable states between, for example, the um, C. diff-dominated uh, unhealthy state with the healthy gut microbiome. And what we would like is to know how to transition between these alternative stable states. Right? So we've been using this as kind of just a model, simple little community that we can use to ask, well, what is it that we can uh, do to perturb this community and induce transitions between them? Right? So we found a variety of different kinds of uh, abiotic perturbations, right? so different uh, perturbations that we impose. But there's also something that we found that I think is really um, kind, of, kind of surprising and, and fun, which is that um, we can induce transitions between these alternative stable states via a third species that acts as a transient invader. So what it does is it catalyzes the transition from, for example, the LP, the lactobacillus dominated state, to the CA, right? And what's interesting is that it doesn't survive the transition, right? So it can, uh, it can induce the transition, but it can't survive that final state. And interestingly, there's a fourth species that we can add to induce the transition in the other direction, where we can, again, make it go back to this state, and it, again, this species doesn't survive, right? So there's a... Uh, well, there are many cases where we observe these transient invaders, where they can induce the transition, but there's no evidence that that's what happened. Because later, you look at it, and the community just switched, and there's no evidence that that species was ever present. And it makes you uh, wonder to what degree uh, species invasions could induce uh, transitions, for example, in the human gut, without showing, uh, leaving any trace. Um, and I don't know if that is real or not, but at least here, we seem to see it. All right, and so with that, I'll, I'll summarize. Right, so we, um, we've been interested in this bottom-up approach to try to understand multi-species community assembly. So here we found that there are just some very simple things that you might expect will happen as you increase mortality in pairs and in, um, in simple communities, and that seems to be borne out uh, in our experiments. Uh, we'd love to be able to see this kind of thing uh, in, for example, the human gut with diarrhea. I was talking with Tammy Lieberman, actually, uh, last week about yeah, whether you could see these kinds of things in complex communities like the human gut or in the worm. We, um, you know, we've also um, been interested in these sorts of network structures, and you know, one of the dominant ones that people talk about are rock, paper, scissors trios. There are experimental examples of, of these, but um, my sense is that, um, that they're, they're not actually so common in, in natural communities. Uh, and, um, and finally, yeah, we found that the, it, the pH seems to be uh, a dominant determinant of how a lot of these species are interacting in a way that I mean, of course, there are many examples where people look at the pH in the context of the oral microbiome and others where it seems to be structuring things. Uh, and it's just a matter of uh, trying to figure out 
which, what are like the list of things that you should first look at when trying to determine the origin, the outcomes that we're seeing uh, in, in various systems. Uh, and with that, I will, uh, I'll thank the group who are the ones that have actually been doing the work. Uh, you guys should all introduce yourselves to Carol and to Al who are here. Uh, and I'll also maybe just mention that I have three postdocs that are going to be starting groups uh, this coming uh, fall. So if you guys are looking for postdocs and so forth, you should check them out. So Nick Vega is starting a faculty position uh, with Bruce over at Emory. Jonathan Friedman is starting the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And Alfonso is going to be starting a group in uh, France with a CNRS position in Toulouse. So um, yes, thank you. <laughs>